Hey guys, so uh, today I'm going to be doing a quick update video on my data workflow and my computer system upgrade. Uh, it's now been three months almost to the day since I've done my major upgrade to both my computer and my data workflow and I'm excited to share it with you today. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm doing, I'm shooting this video today from my cell phone because I want it to be super easy and quick. And also I think it's gonna be the best tool for me to kind of just hand hold it and kind of just show you some of the different components um, versus a more polished video, which I've done in the past. Um, so anyway, if you have not yet already seen my data workflow video that was released last year around the same time. You ready for this? This is the most important thing in my entire business. I'm gonna show you precisely how I do it. This is not a workflow that was slapped together a couple weeks ago. In the entire scope of photography, it can be such a serious problem that it can completely cripple your business. A quick tip when using memory cards. Here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna pull in all of that raw data but most importantly, this drive facilitates two automated daily backups. Can't imagine doing any of this any other way. It was featured on F-Stoppers and was super popular and it helped a lot of you out. There's uh, enormous comments on that video and so I'm gonna hopefully address some of those comments here on this one. Um, but moreover, um, I've done a major uh, upgrade to my computer. Now in the past, I've used Apple. Um, I've been a huge Apple fan for all of my life. I uh, started back when I was in fourth grade with an Apple II GS and then straight through into high school using those clear colored iMacs to learn Photoshop. And then in 2004 or five, I purchased my own G5 white iMac when that was released. And then I had a beautiful uh, tower G5 dual processor power PC with a cinema display. I had that for a few years. And then when I moved to Miami in 2008, I sold it. I bought a 17 inch MacBook Pro, beautiful machine, fully spec'd out. I, and I still have that even today. Um, and then in 2010, when I went full time as a wedding photographer, uh, I purchased the computer that I've had up until this point, which is the i7 27 inch iMac with a matching 27 inch Apple cinema display. And that's the system that was featured in my data workflow video from last year. And that's been my workhorse computer for the last seven years. And it's been pretty good. But understandably, it's seven years old, going on eight, and you know, it's just time to do an upgrade. So understandably, I went and did the obvious, I went right to apple.com and I went into the Apple store. I spoke with some of the uh, representatives there on the business side of things and I looked at what my options were to do an upgrade. And I was very disappointed <clears throat> on where Apple is right now as a company. It's very clear to me, uh, in my opinion, that Apple is really no longer, dare I say, they're no longer a computer company. I think that they are largely an iOS company, which is totally cool and that's fine, um, but it doesn't mean that that's the, gonna be the best fit for me personally moving forward on the computer side of things. So, and just real quick what I mean, and there's nothing wrong with any of their computers, don't think that, and I'm still a big fan. Um, and my wife, she has a, you know, a, a, a MacBook Air or whatever it is and loves it for what she uses it for. So very much still an Apple fan, but the problem is, is that you know, I fully spec'd out their current iMac, which number one looks almost identical to the one that's now seven years old that I have. Um, it's just a lot thinner and at 55 for $5,400, to get that thing maxed out with all the RAM and the best graphics and all that, it was just it was just a huge chunk of money for a system that I just fear would still be outdated uh, in the next couple years. And I also just, there's a huge premium that I was gonna be paying to get the performance. Um, and I started just really looking at this more objectively and I kinda took a step back. 
Um, I've always shied away from PCs because I didn't want to deal with all the issues that were out there. So I never really had considered that before. Um, but now I, I definitely looked at it again. I looked at Windows 10. I looked at the PC side of things. Uh, and I'm telling you, I have now built myself one hell of a monster PC. It's awesome. I am so happy. I have saved so much money, so much more productive than I was before. And I was able to really fine tune and customize my data workflow exactly how I wanted it. And I just, I just couldn't be any happier. And even with the new iMac Pro that uh, Apple has announced that will be shipping in December, at a starting price at $5,000 before I start maxing out any of the settings, it, it, it's just insane to me. It's just insane to me. Uh, the other thing too is the new IMAX and are, they're not user upgradable anymore. So you, you're forced to purchase the components from Apple. So if you want 64 gigs of RAM in the machine, you're going to pay $1,400 to do that. Whereas on the PC side of things and every other computer out there, it would be like $690 for the same exact RAM. So, and that's the same case with the solid state drives and the graphics. All, it's just the ecosystem of Apple and what they've chosen to do. I just can't do it anymore. So anyway, enough talk. Let me get over here. Let me show you the PC and at least show you what I've done. And I'll tell you, I'm super happy. Let's do it. So we'll start with the display. I'm using a Dell display that is a 43 inch 4K ultra high def screen. Absolutely phenomenal. Love it to the moon and back uh, and could not ask really for anything more, especially for a price point that is just under $1,000. Really amazing. This is being mounted to a monitors in motion uh, single BOA mount. And I was using the double BOA version when I had my iMac and cinema display and I just had to purchase the correct vase amount and now I can use it with this. So that's really great. I'll come around here to the side. You get kind of an idea of the profile of that screen. It's very, very thin, uh, very sleek. Love it. Let me come on this side to kind of give you guys a bit of a perspective here of what this all kind of looks like. So 43 inches, if you have not seen that in person, that is a enormous screen. Um, but I much more prefer to use that than two 27 inch screens as I was doing before. I find it to be much more uh, productive for me. I find using applications, especially editing video in a full screen capacity, much, much better. Uh, really love it. This is a six foot dining room table for just for a size reference as well. But, uh, but yeah, also it's worth noting that uh, I also ordered the LG equivalent to this. I purchased both the Dell 43 inch 4K and the LG version of the exact same screen. And I looked at them both. Uh, I don't have any video of that, but I really preferred the Dell just in terms of its physical construction, the way it just felt, the way it went together. And of course the, uh, the colors and performance I just felt were, were the best. So that's the one that I stuck with. Okay, enough with that. Let's jump into the main kind of star of the show, which is this here. And this is a fully customized uh, PC build that I did. I researched all the components myself and purchased them all separately and did the builds uh, myself. And it was very straightforward. It was very easy. Uh, again, Lee Morris has an awesome video on F-stoppers on how to do a PC build. And it only really took like three hours to do. It's not hard. There's no reason for anyone to be intimidated. Uh, and it is incredibly rewarding to be able to pick out all your own components, put it all together, and to have it be exactly what you want. In this case, this is a Fantex full aluminum enclosure. Uh, it's like a brushed aluminum kind of color, like a dark gray, I guess. It has a tempered glass side. It is not a plastic acrylic. It's an actual glass, which is really nice. So it's crystal clear. You can see all the components in there, which is awesome. You can also obviously see that I have some LED lighting going on. That's of, you know, that's optional. You don't have to have that. You can also have the lighting be whatever color you want. You can, right now I have it just cycling through different colors. It's just kind of cool. And at nighttime, it actually completely lights up the entire room, which is really kind of cool. And it gives this awesome kind of a glow and, and it's just great. It just kind of gives it a little bit of personality. And, uh, and I really like that. So we'll start off here with the components uh, inside this machine. I'll try to get closer here. Uh, what you see there is a massive CPU cooler. It's made by a company called Be Quiet, and that is the Dark Rock Pro 3, I believe is what they call it. 
and uh, that is connected to my CPU, which is the uh, i7-7700K, and the K just stands for the unlocked version of that chip. So it's a quad-core i7 chip, and I have it running currently at a 4.5 gigahertz setting with an optional 5 gigahertz overclock on demand whenever I need the extra power. And that's really, really awesome to be able to do that. And that comes in handy for exporting out of Lightroom and for exporting and rendering uh, large video files. I can actually click a setting on the computer, jump up the chip to 5 gigahertz, it will ramp up these fans, and, uh, and I get substantially more performance out of it. That's really awesome. Um, below that is, actually, you know what? I'm going to come on the other side of the desk. I think it will be a little easier to see with the uh, glare. So there we go again. Get that focus in there. Okay, so there's the Dark Rock Pro uh, cooler. And then below this is the GPU, the graphics card. That is the NVIDIA uh, EVGA version, the uh, GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. And that is one fast graphics card. Let me tell you what. Um, I can run a AAA game title as well as any heavy graphics uh, intensive application at full 4K resolution, max settings, and I get well over 60 frames a second in just about everything that I do. Really, really am impressed with that, and that is a huge improvement over anything in the Apple lineup. And one of the big eye-openers was, I mean, just look at the size of that graphics card. I mean, if I come down here even more, uh, let me see here. You can even see like underneath those three fans. They're off right now because there's no load on the system. But when you, know, when you really use it, the fans will come on. They'll, they'll, they'll keep the card cool. That card weighs a few pounds and is about the size of like the whole front end of a normal iMac uh, computer to begin with. And the mere fact that like Apple makes their iMac uh, computers so razor thin is proof that they're really favoring design over functionality and performance. And that's just something that I just don't agree with. You know, they have to throttle back their components because they make them so miniature and so small. And the end user takes a performance hit because of that. Whereas the regular version of a powerful graphics card like this you know, it needs space. It needs a big PC case like this to breathe and to be able to exhaust out the air without having to be throttled back in any way, shape, or form. And I really, really like that. Going back up here to that uh, CPU cooler, by the way, um, it is virtually silent. There are two fans inside of it, and those exhaust right out through the back of the case. So it's a really awesome design. Uh, I did not choose to do water cooling on this computer. That's certainly another option that some people do. Um, so before anyone writes any comments in there, before anyone writes any comments to say, oh, well, why didn't you just do a water cooler? The answer is, is because um, I just don't want to deal with that uh, sort of risk of, you know, having water in a computer and you never know. I mean, they have been known to leak before and in a machine like this, that's so important for all my clients and photos and things like that. I just don't want to take that risk. So uh, the air cooler has been incredible and there's been no problems with that whatsoever. So I just feel a little bit safer running, uh, running that cooler. Down below here, we'll get into the storage. This machine has a total of nine hard drives attached to it, and we'll start right there. If you can see that, that is the Samsung 960 Pro. That is the M.2 uh, SSD. It plugs right into the motherboard, just like a stick of RAM. Lightning fast, about three gigs a second transfer speeds. And on that drive, the only thing I have on it is the operating system and all of the actual applications that I use. Things like Lightroom and Photoshop and Adobe Premiere, things like that. Uh, nothing else goes on that drive. So that way it's always snappy, it's super fast. It's only 512 gigs, so that's plenty of space for what I need it for. And, uh, and it's great, it's the latest and greatest technology. Uh, and as you see, it's super easy to install, just like a stick of RAM. Below that, you'll notice those little numbers. That's a, uh, that's a live view of what the current CPU temperature is. <clears throat> I really like that feature on this motherboard, which, by the way, is a MSI Titanium. This is their, one of their flagship boards. It's, uh, it's a silver traced motherboard, and uh, it's just cool. I really like the looks of it. It had a lot of great reviews, and it has some pretty nice features, such as those uh, slots there for expansion cards are all aligned with metal so it can support the weight of those heavy cards um, just really great really great really great stuff uh, really like the features of it 
So let's come up here to the RAM, which is right there. Connie, you can barely see it. It's just off there to the right. That's those white uh, aluminum sticks. That's 64 gigs of Corsair 3200 megahertz DDR4 RAM. Super fast. And best of all, I paid about just under $700 for 64 gigs. And with Apple, the same exact memory would be $1,400. And again, it's just something that I just think is ridiculous and I just couldn't stand doing. I, 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 just, I just can't play into that anymore. <laughs> All right, so moving along here off to the side, there's a couple SSDs right there. Let me try to get the focus on it. Um, they're, whoop, they're both identical. Those are two different uh, Samsung Pro one terabyte SSDs. One of them is for live work and that one I referenced in my old video as well. So basically that one just has live working data, um, video projects that are currently being edited. And when I export weddings out of Lightroom, it lives on that drive temporarily. Um, the Lightroom actual master catalog file the actual library for Lightroom lives on that SSD, one of those SSDs. And any, basically just any transient data that is just you know, in, in flux or, or in transit that's currently being worked on is on a live work drive. Temporary files, um, contracts that get PDFed to clients, things like that, that are, all that goes on the live work drive. The other one, is just for like fun stuff. So I have a one terabyte for games, which not that I'm a big gamer per se, but the fact that now I have this beast of a machine, I can now take advantage of some new technology. And with my five-year-old son, it is fun. We downloaded some, uh, some driving simulators and bought a steering wheel, which we connected to this computer, and it's awesome. I'm a huge aviation nut. And I actually um, have always been into flight simulation and I use X-Plane 10, which is now X-Plane actually 11. And now I can actually run X-Plane 11 at max settings and it feels like I'm actually flying. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. I can never do that before my iMac. It would always run really slow and you can never really crank up the graphics because it just, it just didn't have the hardware for it. Uh, not only that, but I also uh, have down here in the background a Oculus Rift, let me quickly show you that, a Oculus Rift mask, which I've been playing around with and, uh, and is tons, tons and tons of fun. But anyway, um, coming back here to the drive. So there's three hard drives that you can't really see. There, you see those three white cords? There is, the, bottom one, uh, the bottom one goes to another SSD that is another Samsung Pro that is a two terabyte SSD, and that drive is my quote unquote digital warehouse for all of my images. And that's where uh, wedding images and photo shoots, any data that comes off a camera memory card uh, lives on that drive uh, until it is processed and exported. So that is a two terabyte SSD for that. Um, up above that, there is an eight terabyte uh, Western Digital 5400 RPM backup drive, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. And above that one, there is another identical drive. There's another 8 terabyte backup drive just above that, and that is in a special enclosure, which I'll show you in just a second. Now, over here on this side of the computer is, I'm going to just take off these thumb screws. There are two of them that, uh, that hold this on, so... Bear with me here while I try to do this with one hand. Let me set that down there. Actually, I'm just gonna put my arm against this here just for a second. All right, so once you take off these thumb screws, the whole side of this case will just slide right off like that. Let me just slide this over here. Okay, so this is on the opposite side. This is the not pretty side of the computer that you never normally would never see. But I wanted to show this to you anyway. Let me see if I can uh, get in here even closer. Okay, so you'll see there's three additional hard drives. There's a video, archive, and data. And those are just traditional hard drives that I actually carry over from my old system. They're on these like little, little trays here. If I pinch this down, I can pull this drive straight right out. I would just have to unclip it. And obviously, be a good idea to power off the computer first. <laughs> um, but you'll see the top one is video. 
that's any video project. So these videos that I make, uh, videos of my family and son, YouTube videos, anything at all like that that's video related. Once it's done processing uh, and the video has been exported and uploaded, it goes to that drive. So that's kind of like a video archive drive per se. Below that is just archive and that's for my photography business. So that contains weddings, photo shoots, anything at all like that that has been processed through Lightroom and has then been delivered. And then after the waiting period is over, it then goes to the archive. And I'll speak more about that in just a second. And then down below here is the data drive. And that drive just contains personal data, business data, client contracts, uh, graphics, my logos, Excel sheets, you know, business stuff like that. Anything at all that's just general, you know, like PDFs of like expensive receipts, things like that all go onto that data drive. So, and then over here, I didn't really show you, but this here in the front was that other hidden uh, eight terabyte drive in a special enclosure. This, what looks like a fire door is actually a removable drive bay. And I will remove that for you in a second and show you, I'll be doing, uh, I'll give you like a little demonstration of how this works, but that is my removable off-site drive, uh, which is really, really cool. So that's sort of, uh, that's the overview of the machine itself and the drives attached to it. So let me do this. Let me just kind of grab a memory card and uh, ingest some data here and I'll kind of walk you through how this all kind of goes together. So the very first step is to get the data from the wedding into the computer. Uh, you'll notice here there are two memory cards loaded into this SanDisk USB 3.0 multi-card reader. The first one is my uh, Compact Flash 128 gig card. This lives in my 1DX as a backup card to all the images that I'm shooting all day long at the wedding. I'm also switching out to smaller cards simultaneously. So basically it's a RAID 1 backup in the camera at the point of capture. I do that for, obvi for obvious reasons, for safety, uh, for data loss if one of the cards fails at the wedding. And I also do it because it's super convenient because now I can just come home take out the backup 128 card with all the wedding images on it, load it in here as one card, go take a shower, get a bite to eat, and then when I come back, it's all done. I don't have to sit here and babysit uh, smaller cards individually. So I really like that. The second card that you see in there, that smaller one, that's a 32 gig um, micro SD card. That's my assistance memory cards. So I use a program called Photo Mechanic and in my opinion it is the absolute best, fastest, most efficient way to get data into a computer and to do the entire call process, meaning sorting photos. Nothing is faster, nothing is more efficient in my opinion and if you want to know more about that please watch my other data workflow video where I go into explicit detail on Photo Mechanic. With that said, here is the dialog box. <clears throat> Uh, I can actually import both memory cards simultaneously, which is huge. I love that. So I'm going to select both of those here on the left, and then I'm going to select primary destination. I'm going to select the photo drive, which is my quote-unquote digital warehouse drive. That is the 2 terabyte SSD that I referenced earlier on the computer walk-around. And then I'm going to select the category. So this was a wedding, so I'm going to select weddings. And then I've already made the folder, but I will just show you here what that format looks like. You'll notice that I use a reverse date. That way I keep everything uh, serialized as time goes on. So in this case, it's 2017, 1007, underscore, and the last name or first name, whatever you prefer there. Okay, so then I'm going to go into that folder, and then I have another folder, and that's called RAW. That's where all of the photos from all the memory cards are going to get downloaded into as of right now. This will change in a minute and I'll talk to you about that when it finishes. So first things first, I'm going to tell it OK and then I'm going to tell it Go. And then it's going to go, it's going to start scanning both those cards and then it's going to start uh, importing the photos. So this will take about 30 minutes to download. Uh, both of those memory cards completely. I'll probably have somewhere around 5,000 photos, uh, give or take, and then I'll come back and I'll show you guys the next step. So the import just finished. Both cards are done. We have all the wedding images in there. And uh, let's see, I was right. It's uh, this case, it's 5,011 pictures. It took just a little bit over 30 minutes to get all that data uh, into the computer system. And now it's done. Now, to be clear, 
Um, normally, after I come home from a wedding, it's like, you know, keep in mind, it's like midnight or one o'clock in the morning. What I do is I come over to the desk, I plug in my two master cards, I go take a shower, I usually get a bite to eat, I go right to bed and that's it. I don't sit here, I don't fumble around with anything, I don't look at any pictures, I simply go to sleep and while I'm sleeping, this obviously gets all imported and then it shuts itself off automatically, which is nice. And then most importantly, during the night while I'm sleeping, the computer is doing some work here. So there's a program that I have and I'll show you in a second which one it is. And what it does, every morning at 3.30 in the morning, it wakes up and it's looking at any changes that have happened in the computer. So <clears throat> going back to these hard drives, that middle one is one of two eight terabyte backup drives in this system. And what the program is doing, what the computer is doing, is it's looking at all of the connected hard drives. It's looking at the live work drive, it's looking at the, um, at the games drive, which isn't really important, of course, but uh, it's looking at the video drive, the archive drive, the data drive, and of course, it's looking at that master two terabyte SSD for all the photos. It's looking at all of the connected hard drives in the computer and it is copying over any changes that have happened on any of those drives, plus or minus, and it is creating a mirror of that on that one eight terabyte drive as a backup. It's sort of like a level one backup. This happens automatically. There's no program that I deal with or interact with. I don't have to remember to do any of this. Every day, every night, this is what happens. This is why my system is on 24 seven. It is constantly being updated and changed. And so there's, there's never any fear of any loss of data, right? So now in this scenario, when I wake up in the morning and I come back to my desk, right? And I see all the pictures and I come to the memory cards. At this moment, all of the data is now sitting, of course, on the memory cards. It is also now sitting on the two terabyte SSD hard drive as my master storage drive in this system. And now it's also sitting on one of the eight terabyte backup drives. And then, as if that wasn't enough, <clears throat> what happens is that once the nightly backup of the whole global system is written to that one eight terabyte hard drive, it is then mirrored over on the second eight terabyte hard drive, which is what this guy here is for right here. So let me show you that. I'm gonna come down here to the system and I'm going to eject that so I can show you exactly what I am talking about here. So let me first, uh, there we go. So we'll click eject and now it's off. And so now I can, uh, I can actually unplug the uh, card reader. We don't need that anymore. So now I can just open up this door and pull out this drive. Let me try to adjust the exposure here. And here it is. That's the drive I'm talking about. So this is a 5400 RPM, eight terabyte Western digital drive. And note, it's 5400 RPM because I couldn't care any less about how fast the data transfer is on this drive because all it's doing is just migrating data as slow as it wants overnight, every night onto these drives. So this one is removable and this will go off site once a week. The, and there's also the master copy of it, you can actually still see, you can see it right inside there. It sits right below. That one permanently sits in the computer. So. As of this moment, I now have the wedding in my hands. The wedding is on that drive as a backup. The wedding is on the two terabyte internal SSD for the fast access and processing. That's pretty incredible. So now what's gonna happen is now this drive is gonna go over here to, let me set it over here for a second and I'll open this up. This is a small little Pelican case and you'll notice that there is a, another drive in here right here, same exact drive. So now this, every single week, uh, every single Monday, I go 
and I bring this drive off site to my uh, in law's house and I replace it with last week's copy. So this means in the scenario that I shoot a wedding on a Saturday or Sunday or Friday or whatever it is, every Monday I do this. Every Monday I pull this drive out, swap it out with last week's drive, push this one back in, push in the, uh, the door, and then what will happen is automatically tonight when I go to sleep, I'll wake up in the morning tomorrow morning and now this drive will also have all the updated data from all the drives on there. So that means at that exact moment, I now have the, the whole wedding on the removable drive, the internal backup drive, the photo picture SSD drive, and now it also lives off-site here, safe and secure somewhere many miles away. So to me, that is what I'm going to call, you know, very, very safe. Um, I prefer to do it that way. I know some people think that it's better to do, you know, cloud backups or whatever it is, but I really prefer this method. I love the fact that the data is totally mic in control. I know exactly where it is, and, uh, and, and this is what I do, and this is why I do it that way. So that pretty much summarizes the flow of data. Hopefully, all of that makes sense. Um, I'm going to also now show you what I do next with the wedding. So I'm going to go and I'm going to call down this wedding and get it to the final shots that will actually be delivered to the client. And then I'm going to show you how I bring this into Lightroom. And then I'm also going to show you an example of an older wedding that, uh, that needs to be archived and how the exit strategy works for the data. Because the way I have this workflow set up, none of these drives with the exception of one drive, which is this archive drive right here, that one terabyte archive drive, that's the only drive in this entire system that will ever become capacitized or fill up, you know, however you want to say it. Um, that's the only drive that will ever have to keep being replaced. And that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Okay guys, so I have finished calling this wedding. Um, it took me 90 minutes to go through the 5,000 photos and I've got this narrowed down to about 1,400 shots that are going to be uh, actually delivered to the client. So the next step here um, is I'm going to go to the folder. Let me try to uh, come in close here. Hopefully you can see that. Let me try uh, zooming in the camera and make sure it's in focus. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the root folder here of the client, I'm gonna expand that, I'm gonna right click on it, and I'm gonna create a new folder inside of it. And this is going to be uh, almost the same as their root folder, it's gonna be the reverse date, and the uh, month, day, underscore, last name again. This time though, I'm gonna go another underscore, and it's gonna be called final. Okay, like that. So we have the root folder, which we created when we first imported, which is just the reverse date underscore last name. And then we created the raw folder, and that's where all of these photos went from all the cameras. We've gone through it, we've sorted it, we've got it down to the actual files that are gonna be delivered to the client. And now I'm going to only select those files to the client. I'm gonna select all of them, and I'm gonna hold and drag and drop them into this new final folder. And look how fast that took, by the way, like two seconds and they're gone. So that's awesome. So now all those files are now into that new final folder. So that's the only folder, by the way, that is going to be imported into Lightroom. So that, uh, that does it for Photo Mechanic. I'm gonna close this out now. Uh, am I sure I'm gonna quit? Yes. So now let me show you here, oh and by the way, before I get too far ahead, I do want to just uh, make a note is it took me a total of uh, 90 minutes to go through that wedding and one of the ways I did it was I was able to take my chair, sit back and I used an Xbox One wireless controller connected to my PC, that's what that little wireless Bluetooth dongle is up there for, it's for this controller and I sit back with my beautiful 43 inch uh, 4K display, and I go through, and it's like this. 
super fast. Every time I get to a photo that, that I, I say yes or no to, I push the button, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. This is how I'm able to select f uh, photos from all those raw from all the uh, raw from all the raw files. I go through. I use this to select all the photos. It only took me 90 minutes to go through 5,000 photos. That's amazing. This is a huge, huge advantage. If you're not using a game controller to call your photos, you might want to consider it. And if you are on the Windows side of things, I use this program here. It's called uh, Patter. X Patter, I'm sorry, it's called X Patter. And here you can basically uh, map out what you want all these buttons to do and you can define this for what program you're using. So I'm using one scheme for Photo Mechanic, but then when I click Lightroom, there's the buttons do different things. And I'll show you that in just a second. So actually, let me go ahead and let me launch uh, Lightroom up here. Um, there we go. And now I'll show you the next step so first things here is, um, this is just my master catalog file. So let me click on import down here. Let me fix the exposure a little bit. Okay. Um, and then over here, it's asking me to import what. So here's where I'm selecting on the pictures drive. Whoops, get the camera there. On the P drive, under weddings, there's the root folder, Scott. And then there's those two folders again. There's the I'm not going to select raw. Those fo those files will eventually just be deleted anyway. And I'll tell you about that in a second. For now, we're going to select the final folder, and that's going to queue up those 1,400 shots that will go to the client. And then my import settings, by the way, will start here. It's we're not copying anything. We're just leaving them where they are in that subfolder on the photo picture two terabyte SSD. So we're just adding these files to the Lightroom catalog file. And then over here on the import settings, we're building one-to-one -one previews, which is a full preview. And I do that on purpose so that it loads much faster when it comes time to do the edit. And then I'm not obviously uh, importing duplicates, so I have that checkbox uh, checked as well. I'm not applying any sort of develop settings or anything like that to any of my files. I do that uh, all myself, depending upon um, what's going on in the day. So that's it. So then I'll click import and then this is going to go and this is going to do its thing. Um, and then I might as well show you this over here. So as soon as it's done importing, which would be just a second here, I'm just going to wait for that bar up there to finish. So once it's done importing to the catalog, it's then going to start building the previews and it will take it about 30 minutes, give or take to build the one to one previews. It does take longer to do it that way but it's much faster in the end because I can fly through these photos on the edit side of things. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the folders. I'm going to drop down uh, the different uh, import folders here and I'm going to just drag and drop that last one into the collections. Now let me let me close folders and now, but now let's just look at the collection. So I have four different things here. I have and they're numbered one, two, three, and four so that they stay in chronological order. So the first step is the edit. So right now you'll see I dragged the Scott wedding into the edit and then I have blog slash social media. So when I'm finished doing an edit, I'll drag them then down to the blog social media tab and then here I can take my time, go through them if I want to blog about them or pick out images for social media, I'll do that. Once that's finished, I then will drag them down to the third folder, which is a 90 day hold. And what that is, is once I finished, once I'm finished uh, editing and processing, color correcting all these files, they get exported out, they go online to the Pixie Set Gallery, delivered to the client, the client downloads them. I hold the wedding here for 90 days. After the 90 day mark, I then take it and I will then export this to an archive, and I'll show you that in detail in just a second. And then after it's archived on the archive drive, I then go and I remove it from the system completely. I remove it out of Lightroom, and then I go back to File Manager, and I pull all the raw files out of Photo Mechanic, so it's completely gone. And then that way, the only thing that, I, that remains are all the files that were delivered to the client. The 90-day hold is a safety net. That is, uh, that's, that, that's part of a, 
mindset that I have that, you know, if anything's going to go wrong or if a client's going to complain or if, God forbid, I forgot something and there's, you know, files that need to be uh, looked at or if I, you know, skipped over something during the call or I missed a, a shot or there's any sort of email dialogue back and forth, I use those three months as a safety buffer. And after the three months, by that time, the client I know has seen the whole wedding. They've downloaded it off the online gallery. The gallery actually expires in 90 days, so that's a perfect window uh, for me as well. So I know that once the online gallery expires, I then can go and then remove it from my system, and it's totally okay to do that. So what does get archived is everything that gets delivered to the client, and that becomes this small, tight little small catalog which lives on the archive drive and then the big bloat of the rest of the raw data that was just duplicates or test shots or whatever, all that can just be removed and that keeps this uh, data workflow a very well-oiled machine which again do doesn't ever fill up. The only thing that would ever fill up is the exit strategy which is that archive drive and the average wedding in archive is only about 60 gigs so you can do the math there and figure out how long you'll get with even a $75 one terabyte Hitachi drive, which is what I use. I mean, I usually get a year or two, uh, if not more, uh, use out of that, and that's just incredible. So that's it. That last one there, number four, it says to be deleted. Basically, after I right-click one of these catalogs, so I'll show you right now. So let's just say, for example, that I wanted to archive Joe's wedding here, okay? Um, it hasn't been 90 days yet, so I'm not going to do that. But all I do is I click here, export this collection as catalog. I would tell it OK, and then I get the dialog box over here. And then here, all I would do is come over to here, and I would just select, it's my A drive for archive, which here we go, you can see it better there. And then I select the category wedding, and then right here I would use the reverse date, uh, underscore, and then Joe's name, and then I would make sure, these are our default already checked, but you just want to make sure that you're exporting the negatives. Um, you don't need smart previews and include the, um, the uh, available preview so that everything comes over into a new catalog. And what Lightroom will do is it will take all these photos that are, are, are in the wedding and it will just combine it into its own little catalog on the archive drive that I can then just reference as an independent catalog in Lightroom, double click it, it will open up his wedding and it's, and it's awesome. And that way it allows me to keep this here, this is the master Lightroom catalog which lives on that SSD drive, remember that I was telling you about? So the master catalog file is on the SSD so it's super fast. So the production catalog which is the one here that I'm using remains very, very quick. So I can quickly scrub through any of these weddings, do all the edits, and all that good stuff. And this remains very quick and very snappy. Once it goes to archive, it goes on that smaller rotational drive, and then it's just out of my hair. So anyway, so after I click on, the, uh, on this and I click it to archive, I then drag it to this fourth folder to be deleted. And that way I can just walk away from the computer, and then I just know that whenever, whenever the bar at the top is done, whatever whatever uh, weddings are in that to be deleted folder, then I just need to go and verify on the archive drive that it has in fact exported safely. And once I verify the catalog, I then will go and I will remove it from uh, the Lightroom master catalog file. And then I will also go in file manager and remove that raw folder. And basically the whole client folder comes off the picture SSD. And that's it. And that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the data flow there. Um, oh yeah, I almost forgot. Um, I forgot to show you guys the program that I use to go and um, do those automated uh, seamless backups of all the drives in the computer. So let me show you that here. So basically, let me come down here, let me just open it and then I'll bring the camera up. The program is called Vice Versa Pro. And on the, when I had my uh, iMac, I used a program called Carbon Copy Cloner, 
And that was an amazing program and it basically did the same thing. When I switched to Windows 10 here on the PC side of things, I was looking for a program that would basically do the same thing. I downloaded three different uh, types of programs and I settled on this one. Uh, I really like this one the best. There's a couple different pieces of it. There's, this is the scheduler. Uh, I'm just gonna hit okay to run it. And this, let me fix the exposure. So this part here is how I schedule these different tasks. And if we look at this here closely, hopefully we can see this, the, you'll see these represent all the different hard drives on my system. So starting here with the top, there's the archive nightly backup, which starts at 3.30 a.m. There's the da daily nightly backup, the live work nightly backup, the offsite backup, which is that removable drive, picture nightly backup, which is the photo SSD, and then the video nightly backup. So all of these, and all of these are staggered within 10 minutes of each other, and they're all programmed to wait until one is finished, until it goes to the next. Um, and every single morning, it goes and does it, and it will write a status log here, and if there's any issues or anything like that, uh, it will let me know. So, and this just runs magically in, in the background. So it has been a unbelievable uh, thing to, to have, and I would recommend that anybody uh, get something like that to fully automate their, their backup. The other thing that I just wanted to quickly talk about here before I sign off on this is on the SSD side of things, um, you know, I realize I'm using a two terabyte SSD for my raw data and for my, for my pictures and all that. Um, if you do a little research, you're, you're gonna find out that that's a thousand dollar drive. It's very expensive and it's not required whatsoever. The only reason I went with an SSD for all my raw data, and before, by the way, on the iMac, I had all these drives that I'm talking about, I had as a part of my old setup, and they were all external drives, and there were so many power cables and, and, and like extension cables and USB cables and all that crap, and all these different like drive GTEC enclosures that I was using that were just loud and obnoxious, and, and it was much more cumbersome to have to like take the drives out and all this stuff. So I'm so happy to have this PC tower where everything is just in like one unified case. I really like that a lot. But before it was a three terabyte rotational RAID 5 drive that was the digital warehouse. And that's what I was using before for all my raw data. And I say RAID 5, that, and that all, all that just means is that the data was striped across four different hard drives which totaled three terabytes. Um, and that was fine too. The thing is is that I wanted to do away with another rotational drive. I wanted to be able to have as fast of an access as possible to the raw data when it came to importing and exporting. Because there are times where I, I may import a shoot. Uh, it may not be a wedding, but it could be, or, or an engagement session or something like that, where there's just a couple hundred photos. And I, and I will literally just import it. And because it's so fast to get the data from the card on the SSD and then another SSD is used for the processing. I can just sit here and hammer out these sessions within a couple hours and I'm totally done and I can get up and just kind of wipe my hands of it and move on to the next thing in my life. And I really like that a lot. It's also very handy when it comes to exporting. You know, it, exporting all those files after they've been rendered out of Lightroom only takes a, a few minutes and that's really awesome and that's another area where uh, I really wanted to have that speed. I like the fact that I'm mixing an SSD with rotational backup because you know you could argue that maybe the SSD isn't as stable, maybe it's more, you know, some people are freaked out that you know it, that it's not as secure as the old school hard drives. I'm not gonna pretend that I know and I'm not even gonna share my opinion on that because it just doesn't matter. But I will say that I am getting the best out of both worlds here in this setup. I'm getting the speed and efficiency of an SSD, and I'm getting the reliability and redundancy of using rotational drives uh, in many different ways here. So altogether, it kind of makes for a system that I'm, I'm really, really happy about. The last thing I'm gonna comment on <clears throat> is the fact that I'm using two terabytes. I wouldn't wanna use any more than that to store my weddings. The average wedding in hold is around 100 gigs, give or take maybe 10 gigs, right? So between say 80 and 100 gigabytes. 
And in an SSD, you don't want to fully capacitize a drive like that because you want to leave room on an SSD for its auto provisioning technology and things like that. So, you know, let's just play it super safe and say 50% capacity, right? So that would be like 10, between 10 and 15 weddings would fully like max out that two terabyte SSD. And some of you might be thinking that that's not enough and you know, that you should have a much larger drive for all that. Here's the thing, the advantage of having the wedding on a smaller SSD drive like that means that it forces me to keep the ball rolling and to keep the data flow moving. And on average, if I shoot a wedding on a Saturday, generally speaking, believe it or not, the client has their wedding completely done and edited, color corrected in the online gallery usually by like Tuesday or Wednesday at the latest. That way things don't sit around and collect dust, people aren't waiting, and this whole flow of data is also really good for the client in terms of turnaround time. And I really, really like that. It's another way that, that just kind of keeps, it forces me to just push things right along so that I can get them through all these different checkpoints right into the archive drive well into the client's hands, on blogs, on websites, on social media, that kind of thing. And then this whole cycle will just repeat and rinse and repeat over and over again for all the next weddings. So within a 90 day span, as long as I can float between 10 to 15 weddings on the SSD, this, this workflow is, is just going to be amazing well into the future. And I, I've already demonstrated to myself that this workflow pretty much works, it's pretty much bulletproof and it's been that way for the last seven years. And this is sort of just now like the next level up from that. So really excited. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit about it. And again, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to let me know. Thanks guys.